Hello dear friends, I'm sharing this video because this case turned out to be much harder than I thought. The patient was a 93 year old individual who had a very hard cataract. This was the maximum pupillary dilatation that I got and also I found that the anterior chamber was very very shallow. Let me steer you through the various twists and turns that I faced during this case. Stay with me because there are lots of points of learning in this video. So after staining the anterior capsule, I create the clear corneal incision. Of course, you see that with this grade of nucleosclerotic cataract, it's not possible to handle it with the size of pupil that we have. And therefore, the first step is to use a pupil dilating device. This is a Gupta ring and you can see that I'm loading it onto the injector system. So the ring is then injected into the eye. The chamber is extremely shallow and therefore you have to be very careful while injecting the ring. I'm able to engage three of the four loops onto the pupillary edge while performing this injection. As the ring goes in, I thought I saw the lens shake and this gave me a little apprehension that is there a zonular dialysis and does the patient have a subluxated lens as well. The patient did not have any phacodonosis in the preoperative clinical examination. Once the Gupta ring is in place, it is then positioned adequately and properly to get a good exposure of the lens. And the capsular excess is now being performed using a uterata forceps. The problem here is that only the central part of the anterior capsule has been stained. And, but I have to get a capsular excess that is more than 5.5 millimeters in size. Even though it was challenging and someone managed to get it right. Minimal amount of cortical cleavage hydrodissection is enough and this nucleus will rotate. I'm now putting in a high molecular weight viscoelastic combination of chondroitin sulfate and sodium hyaluronate and beneath that putting in some amount of HPMC. This is necessary in order to protect the corneal endothelium. So as soon as I enter, I find there's a conjunctival ballooning. Therefore, I make a small nick in the conjunctiva. Conjunctival ballooning, if not detected early, will build up and create a lot of problems later on in the procedure. This nucleus management is totally unedited. The tip of the phaco probe has been exposed to almost 2 millimeters. This is what I do when I handle hard cataracts. I'm performing the phaco emulsification using a multi-burst mode. The power in this case is just 40% with a burst duration of 30 milliseconds and a duty cycle of 75%. In this case, I'm going to perform the sequential phaco job where the pieces are created on the go and as the pieces are created, they are removed. I thought I had broken off a small piece but you see that because of the large mass of the lens even the small piece once it is mobilized looks pretty large. The sequential phaco chop has the advantage in that there is only one piece in the anterior chamber. The amount of fragments flying around in the anterior chamber is greatly minimized. Now you notice that while performing the second chop, I did not carry this chop through and through and therefore while the piece is emulsified, I find that a bit of it is still sticking on to the posterior plate. I don't try to remove it, I am going to include it while I remove the next piece. So I create the chop, I create the separation and this time I make sure the separation goes through and through and the piece is completely free before I mobilize and eat it up.
So it's a very important point to stress that before you mobilize the pieces, you just make sure that the piece is completely free. Otherwise, it will tag on the entire nucleus and you will have a tumbling of the nucleus, which would be very detrimental to the nucleus disassembly procedure. So as I rotate the nucleus within the capsular bag, I find that the nucleus is not so large. It is probably going into a hypermaturity state. However, the 5.5 to 6 mm nucleus is extremely hard and leathery and posing quite a challenge to disassemble. Position the nuclear piece in a favorable spot that is exactly opposite the incision before you perform the chop and then make sure that the tip is adequately buried and the hold is very good before you create the crack and the lateral separation. Make sure that the piece is free and then you eat it up in the central zone where the dome of the cornea is furthest away from the lens particle. At this point, you have to be very careful because you're working with a pretty high vacuum. The shallow chamber is quite evident because the second instrument is not able to get in easily into the anterior chamber. While removing the last piece, as I was saying, you have to be sure that you reduce the vacuum from about 350 to 250 millimeters of mercury. And then you also reduce the power to about half of what you've set. Now, after I remove the piece, I find that there is a small nucleus fragment in the anterior chamber. I try to float it out using viscoelastic, but I actually end up sending it underneath the iris. So, I am not going to try to remove this piece with the help of viscoelastic. I thought I will remove the piece using the coaxial IA itself. Also, the posterior capsule is extremely thin and there is an area that looks suspiciously like a PC rent, which is nothing but cortex. So, I got the piece. Sometimes we like to crush it and remove it, but this is a simpler way of getting it. With high vacuum, you simply pull it out of the incision. Provided the piece is small, it will come out. cellular debris or a cellular dust that is settled on the posterior capsule is then removed with the help of the coaxial IA probe. I thought that the worst part of the case is over, the nucleus management, and now I can relax. All I need to do is to put in the intraocular lens and I am done with this case. While injecting the intraocular lens, I had my second setback. I found that the OT nurse who had loaded the lens had loaded it improperly and the trailing haptic got stuck in the plunger. Trying to extricate it, I actually ended up breaking up the trailing haptic completely. Well, there is no doubt this lens has to be explanted. You can't just leave it in the capsular bag because it will decenter. I did not try an anterior optic capture because the chamber is also very shallow. So I plan to explant this intraocular lens. The procedure which I'm going to use is what I call the Pac-Man cut or a semi-section of the lens. And in order to do that, the lens is carefully dialed out of the capsular bag into the anterior chamber. There's also the Gupta ring to take into consideration. You have to orient the IOL so that the haptics are facing right angles to the incision. The incision also needs to be slightly enlarged from 2.8 to almost 4 millimeters because this will make it comfortable for you to remove the lens. The side port is also enlarged slightly to allow the intraocular forceps to enter and grasp the optic of the lens. Using a Sinsky hook, the optic of the lens is fed 
to the intraocular forceps. Try to grasp the lens at the junction where the optic and the haptic meet because that's the most favorable place in which you can hold on to the lens. The cutting of the optic of the IOL is done with the help of a Warner scissors. There are no special scissors. I'm just using a simple Warner scissors to do it. It is also the most effective way of cutting the lens because most of the intraocular scissors that I have used tend to get blunt with using it for a couple of times. Now the anterior chamber is deepened with the viscoat, the heavy molecular weight viscoelastic and then you have to grasp one end of the Pacman cut on the optic of the IOL and simply rotate it out of the incision and it comes out of the incision. In this particular case, I'm not going to give my OT assistant a second chance to load the IOL correctly. I take it upon myself to do it. The butterfly cartridge is primed with the viscoelastic. The intraocular lens is then loaded inside the cartridge very carefully. So after loading it, I make sure that I tuck the trailing haptic over the optic of the lens. I also make sure that this tuck is good. And also finally confirmed by the push test where I retract the plunger and make sure that the IOL is completely free from the plunger. And only after making all these necessary adjustments, I go ahead and inject the IOL. And this time the IOL is implanted within the capsular bag. The case is concluded by finally removing the Gupta ring from the eye. Thank you for your attention.